We can also talk today about a story that I uh, published late last night, kind of a, a profile of uh, Daily Coast, a, a website that probably most of you are familiar with. Got its start in kind of in the heyday of the blogosphere, which is a, around the time that I got into journalism as well. George W. Bush was president. Uh, it was kind of like a really heady time for these kind of left-wing blogs that, that, that jumped up, uh, Young Turks kind of being being part of that, it, launching in, in 2002, I believe, was when Cenk uh, first did his uh, Young Turks show. Uh, so uh, 2005, you've got George W. Bush in the White House, you've got the Iraq War uh, going all to hell, and it, it, it is a lot more satisfying and it's a lot easier uh, as, a, as a pundit and even as a crusading journalist to kind of be against things than to be figuring things out or being for things. It's just, it's just how it is, and I'll admit that it is, it is, it is, it is satisfying to to find an enemy, identify it, uh, and, and and go after it. It's it's kind of what journalists uh, thrive on, and so the kind of liberal blogosphere in uh, 04, 05, 06 was really humming along. When President Obama came in, uh, their role became a lot less clear because you know where is a kind of lefty democratic opposition going to be when uh, a partisan opposition when the when your party actually controls the white house and so you know they 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 struggled a bit for you know during that period but they continued to build kind of an infrastructure uh and and some organizing capacity through their email list then in 2016 uh there there was a there were knockdown drag out fights on the site over uh W over Bernie Sanders and, and Hillary Clinton with, with uh, Marcos coming in in early March and saying, look, this race is over. We didn't endorse anybody, although, you know, people assumed that, uh, you know, the, the leadership of the site was, was for Clinton. In early March, they said, look, only constructive criticism will be allowed from here. A lot of uh, Sanders-supporting bloggers uh, left. Uh, there was a lot of acrimony uh, between the different communities, and it kind of faded into the election from there. After the election, Daily Coast, though, has been on fire in terms of fundraising. They pumped more than a million dollars into a special election in Georgia when the uh, Bernie Sanders-backed candidate in uh, Kansas needed help. They turned on the spigot, sent about $160,000 in just a couple of days to that race. They're now sending money to Rob Quist, another Bernie-backed candidate in Montana, uh, and I think you're going to see them do more of that in the race in South Carolina. So it poses a challenging question for people. Okay, this, this was an organization that got into uh, bitter fights with uh, elements of the Bernie supporting wing uh, and continues to this day. You can read my interview that I did with Marcos, and he has unkind things to say about uh, elements of the, the Sanders wing. Continues to this day, yet is a fundraising powerhouse for uh, progressive populist uh, Bernie-crat Democrats. Where did Daily Coast go if it's right. back? <laughs> right, and a bunch of people were dragging me for that. Like, it, it's, it's just a headline. It, but basically the point would be uh, Daily Coast was not uh, at the top of the political conversation throughout much of the Obama administration. They were plugging away. They were doing the work, local elections, state elections, congressional elections, but they were not a part of the national conversation the way that they were in a very real way and from 2005 until President Bush left office. And now uh, with special elections coming to the fore and the national party being so hesitant to get involved, uh, people are giving their money through Daily Coast and Daily Coast is organizing their, their members and directing them uh, towards, say, Georgia. And uh, in my interview, and I didn't get to put this into the story, but uh, Marcos told me, he's like, I'm an immigrant. That's one of the most important issues to me. And I have given our members the, the opportunity to take a bunch of different actions on immigration, but they couldn't be bothered. Uh, now, he's, uh, with tr President Trump wanting to build a wall, immigration is a, is a hot issue for them. With, with the roundups going on, people are, people are genuinely fired up about it. But before that, uh, liberals and progressives in general uh, had had what Marcus would call the right position on immigration, but it wasn't it wasn't top of mind. It wasn't something they were going to take action on. And he's like, look, this this is my site. Uh, I deeply wanted to push this issue, but people weren't into it, and and so I couldn't. Now, th so th but there, there's two there are two two sides to that coin. So the the site can the site can't force people to do something 
positively, but what it can do is it can stop people from doing something. And, and the, the stopping in 2016 from su uh, supporting Bernie Sanders after March uh, is the thing that you know, picked him up probably the most ill will. Why did he choose March? In early, so in early March, uh, I mean, that was early in the campaign, but it was plausible to say, okay, because of all of these superdelegates, uh, it's going to be almost impossible for Sanders to come back because of the way the system is set up. Uh, and if, at, at that time, Sanders' argument was, well, I'm going to win the popular vote and I'm going to persuade the superdelegates to flip. Uh, you know that was always going to be a challenge. Let's say you could, even, let's say he could win the popular vote, convincing these Clinton stooges who owe their entire careers to the Clintons to flip uh, was always going to be difficult. And so Marcos's uh, explanation at the time was, well, it, it's it's over, so it's time to t pivot to the general election. Okay, I'm going to come in with you for a second. Hold on, I want to ask a question to the audience. So, okay, okay, so I think it's pretty clear from, if you read Ryan's piece, Marcos was kind of talking, Marcos Melitza was kind of talking about outlets like the Young Turks when he said that we chose not to continue to ride the Bernie enthusiasm after, in his assessment, the primary was over and grow our, num our membership. And so I can tell you, TYT Politics, we definitely grew our membership uh, between the time of mid-March when it seemed like it was over and really the end of the election. And really, helping to drive a wedge within the progressive coalition. I don't know if you picked up on that. Maybe there are other people he could have been referencing. And Marcos is a friend of mine. I identify with the immigrant community a lot. We've worked together on those issues. But here's the thing. If we didn't give you somebody to be mad at in every video, if we didn't, I think the word you used earlier, Ryan, uh, was uh, you, know, you, you pick an enemy. Mm -hmm. If there wasn't an enemy in every video, would you still watch? Because we want to keep you engaged, but at the same time, um, sometimes just picking a fight for the sake of picking a fight is counterproductive. So I'm going to look at back in the comments, and Ryan, why don't you respond to that? Well, and that, that's this, that's known as the 60 minutes style. Like if you if you look at what makes a very typical 60 minutes segment, they have an enemy. Uh, you know, you need kind of a villain in order, in order to drive a narrative. So. Uh, and oftentimes in this world, you don't need to uh, concoct villains out of nowhere. You you kind of just look around and 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 there they are. Uh, so, yeah, I'm curious what curious what other people uh, think about that. Yeah, and we'll continue reading in this, uh, you know, because there's something like reflective. It's like a, we're talking about a conversation, like we're talking about a fight, but we're part of that fight. Yeah, he, he certainly did, did not uh, single out Young Turks by any by any stretch when he was saying that uh, certain uh, you know organizations you know relied on the kind of Sanders movement to 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 lift them up. Um, I think uh, places like U.S. Uncut, you know, that that really like surged in in traffic, um, and actually like a lot of these Macedonian <laughs> folks that were, were in it either for uh, money or for whatever, uh, you know, realized that uh, that there was a lot of traffic to be had there. At, at the Huffington Post, uh, you know, we were, we were running uh, blog posts by H.A. Goodman. And, you know, if you go back and look at what he was writing from March to June, he was convinced that Sanders was going to win, Hillary was going to get indicted. After the convention, he starts saying Trump's going to win. And then James Comey comes out and drops that letter, and Trump does end up winning. So, it, you know, these are all really thorny questions. And my take on it has always just been to be just as honest in the moment as I possibly can uh, and tell you exactly what I feel, uh, whether or not you want to hear it or not. Karen Butler Davis says, I watch because you are the closest to the truth that anyone is offering, and there doesn't need to be a villain. Well, there you go. Yeah. And now, if there is a villain, we want to identify them. Uh, that is an extremely important part of, of journalism, flagging who's doing wrong so that public pressure can be put on them uh, in order to stop them from doing wrong. H however, I totally agree with that, that if, if, uh, you know, if there is no villain, don't concoct one, and we can bring you substantive news uh, that, that doesn't need that as a context. John Coleman says, 
This is what caused the switch from news outlets to opinion outlets, Fox, MSNBC, or whatever. It was the crossfire thing that John Stewart was talking about. As soon as they realized it was cheaper and more compelling dramatically to just have people argue adversarially on TV rather than cover the news, it just became the thing to do. Yeah, I mean, a, a opinion is certainly easier than gathering news, dig, you know, d digging, doing inv the, the kind of investigative work that Young Turks is going to be doing, you know, uh, going forward with a, lo with a lot of the uh, contributions that members have actually made. Uh, so. You're, but yes, absolutely. Uh, opinion is opinion is much cheaper. You know, when I was in Little League, my coach was my dad. He told me, this, this is a hard and fast rule, you never get down on your teammates. So when I was in the backseat on the way home from the game and I was trying to cope with losing, I would say, the umpire, it was the umpire's fault. Like, I, at that age, I couldn't cope with a defeat yes. unless I had somebody to blame. And ultimately, I realized as I went on in baseball that if you only focus on someone to blame when you're coping with a defeat, you don't become a, a better ball player. You, you, you have to examine what happened, and you have to do it in, a, in an honest way, but you, you, can get, you can get too caught up in looking for excuses, or, uh, or, or, and, and you can wind up missing the, the opportunities that are in front of you. Uh, so, I mean, let, let, let's imagine for a second that... Uh, that Hillary Clinton did win the White House. In 2018, you, you see an absolute wipeout, probably. Republicans just sweep in both the Senate and the, and the House. And this would be after two years of them launching uh, investigations into her and her, her, her cronies. And the type of cronies that she has, you know, they launch enough investigations, they're gonna find enough to like keep the news cycle going on this issue. Not only do you get wiped out uh, in Congress, you're getting wiped out in state legislatures and in governor's mansions all across the country. And this is, comes just before you're doing the census in, in 2020. It gets, to a, it gets to a place where you don't functionally have a Democratic Party in many places of the country if that continued to happen. Because a lot of people think about the Democratic Party in 2016 as kind of a stable state. But it's, it wasn't. It was... It was collapsing. It was in a, a rapid decline. Uh, you know, a, a thousand seats that they'd lost over the last eight years, that, that thousand would have become, you know, quickly 1,200, 1,300, 1,400. You certainly don't have uh, people like Asaf uh, on the threshold of winning in Georgia. You don't have James Thompson coming within seven points, six, seven points in, in blood red Kansas. You don't have the indivisible groups forming. You don't have uh, party membership swelling with people from our revolution and people from the Sanders movement who are now joining uh, their local democratic parties and, and doubling and tripling and quadrupling the number of people who are getting involved at the local level. So if you were in the car coming home from a losing Little League game, you would have said silver lining. It's going to make us better. <laughs> yes. We learned from this.